distinguished panel, and also to thank FCTV for filming this live so that those of you who can't come out tonight can still participate in this program. The League is a nonpartisan political organization. We're nonpartisan because we never support a candidate or a political party. We're political because we do take positions on public policy issues, but only after study and discussion. Membership is open to women and men, as you can tell. We invite you to learn more about us and to consider becoming a member by going to our webpage, www.lwvf.org. We present public meetings once a month on subjects of public interest and concern. Tonight's presentation is one of those presentations. As you know, Falmouth's coastal ponds and estuaries are subject to pollution from adjacent surface water runoff and septic system effluent. Approximately 11% of the residences in, in Falmouth are on town sewer systems with treatment facilities in West Falmouth and the new Silver Beach facility. Massachusetts DEP has mandated that we reduce pollution in our waters. The Little Pond Sewer Project was a response to that, as is the planned extension of sewering to more of the Great Pond area. There are limits to the volume, which can be discharged from the main treatment plant, and options for future expansion include other treatment plants, a deep water outfall into the bay or sound, significant improvements to home septic systems in order to avoid sewering and perhaps others. Each of these options has a price tag associated with it and we have a very distinguished panel here tonight to talk about the issue and some of those options and to uh, answer our questions about that. With us tonight we have Amy Lowell who is the Falmouth Wastewater Superintendent, Eric Turkington, the Chair of the Falmouth Water Management Committee, Scott McGann, who is the Falmouth Health Agent, Andrew Gottlieb, the Executive Director of the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, and Brian Baumgartel, Director of the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center. Each uh, panelist will be given eight minutes to talk. Uh, some have PowerPoint presentations, others don't. Uh, and I'd like to hold all the questions until after they have all spoken so that then you can ask questions of them and they can have discussion among them about the points that they've raised. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. We're going to ask Eric to start first. Okay. Eric will start first. Thank you. I'm going to actually move the microphone to the screen here so I can see, the, uh, see what I'm talking about. Uh, see you on church. is the one who does all the work for our committee. Uh, I, I'm Eric Turkington, Chairman of the Water Quality Committee. Thank the League for doing this. Thank Doug for showing up, the, uh, our selectman who always shows up at everything. Um, there's some people in this room who have been doing this for 40 years in this town. It's sewer, wastewater has been that kind of an issue. But there are some people who are brand new. Uh, so the presentation tonight is going to be for both. Um, so I will talk real fast. It's going to be like speed dating because eight minutes from now, she's going to shut me off. <laughs> so as you've heard, we have estuaries. We have 14 estuaries. We have more estuaries than any other town in Massachusetts. Uh, they're all impaired. Uh, they're impaired by a lot of things. But, the, but the, the, the cause that we can do something about is the nitrogen from wastewater that gets into the groundwater and gets into the estuaries. The existing sewer system is pretty small in the town of Falmouth. Uh, we did nothing about it until the 40s when we did a little bit in Woods Hole in the 80s after considerable debate, which many people <laughs> might here remember. We extended the system, but it still only covers 2,400 parcels. The whole rest of the town is on septic system or even cesspools. There are a lot of ways that have been worked up to reduce nitrogen. Um, sewering, of course, is the, the fallback position uh, historically, and in densely populated areas close to our estuaries, that's where the town has been concentrating its sewering efforts. But there's a lot of different other things that we've been doing over the last 10 years besides the sewering. We're looking for alternatives. We've been trying out alternatives. Inlet widening. 
Bourne's Pond, we're going to open the inlet there so that more water flows in and out. That reduces the nitrogen. Permeable reactive barriers. We actually put one in the ground where we're testing. As it comes to the groundwater, the nitrogen gets intercepted by a carbon shield, as it were, and it doesn't, doesn't get to the estuary. So we've been trying that one out. Shellfish, we know, gets rid of nitrogen. We have a couple of acres of, of floating shellfish, which is doing a good job at removing nitrogen. Uh, mill pond restoration is where you, you take a pond that's upstream from one of these estuaries, and, and you basically use it to intercept the nitrogen as it flows to, into the estuary. We spent a lot of time and money looking at echo toilets, because I know there's a constituency for that. Um, at the end of our spending time and money, we concluded that it was not going to be an acceptable route for most people, uh, because frankly, they didn't want to change their houses to install echo toilets. And, and that was pretty much the end of that pursuit. Uh, IA systems you're going to hear all about from two people who are the world's expert on that subject. Further on, <laughs> well, maybe one person who's the world's expert on that subject. But he, he, Comparatively, but compared to him, no. You've got the best brains in the business right here. Fertilizer control, we know that's good. Uh, Falmouth has the toughest bylaw on Cape Cod regarding that. You can't do any fertilizer within 100 feet of an estuary in Falmouth. Stormwater management, we have left up to the DPW because that's what they do, and they've got the federal government telling them how much, how much and how fast they have to do it. So these are the alternatives. Bourne's Pond Inlet Widening is going to happen next year, we've been promised. We voted for it in 2000, 2014, but it's taken the permitting that long to get it to where it is now. The permeable reactive barrier, you can see the picture. That, that's in the ground. Eel River demonstration, that's the shellfish in the, in, in the water. Mill pond restoration, that's the big hole where it catches the flow. Echo toilets, you see what they look like. We've discussed them. IAs, you're going to hear more about. We have good pictures. And, and, and Falmouth has been, by the way, leading the way on IAs. We've been putting them into the ground the ones that work, or the ones they hope work, uh, for the last few years. Sewering is what we are also doing some of. You heard about Little Pond. The way the town's been approaching this is to first do the most impacted estuaries, only do it when you can do it financially without raising the taxes, which old debt gets paid off, new debt can be taken on. That's, that's how we've done it up to now, and that's the way has been very successful with the voters. We would like to use these alternatives wherever we can, whenever we can, and sewer only where necessary. This is a chart showing how much nitrogen has to come out of each one of our estuaries. You see the 14 estuaries. The ones on the west coast, on the Buzzards Bay side, are relatively unimpacted. They're all impacted some, but they're relatively unimpacted. You know, 600, 300 that kind of number. When you get to the south coast, that's where the huge impact of nitrogen is hitting these estuaries. Little Pond is huge. Great Pond is huger. Green Pond's pretty big. Boynes Pond's big. And, and of course, Walkwood Bay will be the, the challenge of all challenges because it's got 43 sub-estuaries, and it's shared by two towns. So it will be a gargantuan problem uh, when, when we get there. The one we've done already, Little Pond Sewer Service Area, voted in 2014, completed in 2017, cost 40 million bucks. It's going to reduce the nitrogen going to that water body by 88%. So our next step was to say, now that we've stewarded, let's see what happens to the ponds. So we've got the USGS, we get the MBL, and we get SMAS, all on contract to, to monitor the results of that nitrogen removal and see how much improvement are we going to see in that pond now that we've done what we need to do? The next one is Great Pond. Again, it's huge. We're talking about 12,000 kilograms per year to be removed. Um, we're talking about sewering. Can you show me the next one here? A couple of, couple of parts of that. The first phase would be south of Route 28, uh, sort of between Falmouth Port and Mary Vista Avenue down toward Perch Pond, that green area. 
That's the phase one, which hopefully would be voted in 2024 and put put in and hooked up by 2027. The next one would be the gray area. Number two, Acapesca Sewer Service Area. That would be hopefully five years later. Um, and then, of course, you have to plan for Ezra. Would, Amy will tell you what Ezra is. <laughs> I can take over from you. Have we hit 12? We've, yep. Okay, did I hit my eight minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I t told you I'd talk fast. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I'm Amy Lola. I'm the town's wastewater superintendent. And as Eric said, the next estuary that, that, that we have been working towards um, meeting the nitrogen load limit for is Great Pond. And the reason for that is that, as Eric was pointing out, it's the largest bar on that graph as far as nitrogen removal that's required. Um, it's uh, the most, it's greatly impacted by nutrients, and it's also adjacent to our existing sewer area. Uh, so it's the next, next east from our existing sewer area and most, most uh, reasonable to proceed from where we are now. Uh, because of the density of the existing development in the lower watershed to Gray Pond, um, and because of the amount of nitrogen removal that's required from this watershed, uh, sewering is the core of the strategy for meeting the load limit for um, and improving water quality in Grape Pond. Um, so uh, what we have here, this entire blue blob here on the plan is the watershed to Grape Pond. Um, that's an enormous area and a lot of uh, nitrogen is collected within that area. The sewer area that we'll be focusing on is in the lower watershed to Grape Pond, which is um, you, I don't know if you can see through here, but this is Route 28. Uh, and we're planning on focusing our sewering in the most densely developed part of uh, the watershed, which is south of Route 28. Uh, the biggest challenge of uh, expanding our wastewater collection system and managing that wastewater is actually the uh, location, locating a discharge site for that treated uh, wastewater. Because even if even once we've collected the wastewater and we have treated it to a very high degree, even once we remove 95% of the nitrogen from that wastewater, there's still a little bit of nitrogen left in that wastewater. And if you put it back on the ground anywhere in Falmouth, it's in the watershed to, an, to a coastal pond, and it therefore is contributing nitrogen load back to that pond. So it becomes a real challenge, a sort of chasing your tail uh, problem uh, with um, siting wastewater discharge in Falmouth. So in this planning process for Great Pond, we've really been focused on discharge siting as, as the main objective or the main challenge of that process. And in considering the discharge sites, um, we, have, uh, we started by looking at the flows that we would need to be planning for. So we looked at the flow we're planning for for the Great Pond watershed but also for future flows because you don't want to, in this, in this effort of um, evaluating discharge sites, you don't want to um, um, just plan for our next little step and then run into the same problem again uh, with the steps beyond that. We know there's a lot to do beyond Gray Pond, so we're planning for the future as well. Um, so as Eric was, was showing, we have these uh, phase one and phase two sewer areas for Gray Pond. So our short-term need, as far as wastewater flow, is to handle, uh, to be able to discharge the flow from those two areas, as well as additional wastewater flow that c will come or could come from our existing sewer service area. Uh, in particular, the corridor along Main Street, Davis Straits, T-Ticket Highway, th um, that uh, area is sewered um, between uh, approximately Town Hall and uh, Sandwich Road. And redevelopment is, uh, that's part of the, as you, you may remember from last year, Mr. Codd, the new uh, zoning bylaw that in actually encourages redevelopment within that area. So part of our planning for the next phase of sewering is to uh, allow for a, a redevelopment within that area. So that short-term need is for 500,000 gallons uh, a day of wastewater discharge, treated wastewater discharge. Uh, beyond that, we really haven't planned 
uh, in any detail for watersheds east of um, or beyond the Great Pond watershed. But we have uh, the Water Quality Management Committee did take a preliminary look at the more densely developed um, portions of the uh, watersheds uh, east of Great Pond and highlighted on this figure uh, in red or pink, whatever that color <laughs> would be described as, um, as uh, the most likely or most sensible sewer areas approximately within that area. And um, that's Fisherman's Cove, Seacoast Shores, Sea Pit, Antler Shores. And it also, we also have included in that midterm um, sewer planning phase uh, oyster pond, uh, for which there's a history of wastewater planning. The estimated flow from that area is about 340,000 gallons per day. And then finally, we've looked at a long-term or a longer-term uh, set of flows, which would be a contingency plan for the Great Pond watershed if, in fact, additional sewering were needed north of uh, Route 28 in the future. Um, and uh, that estimated flow is 190,000 gallons per day. So what we looked at overall in, um, in looking for a discharge site was, was approximately a million, a million gallons a day of discharge capacity. Um, we spent a great deal of uh, effort over the last couple of years evaluating these three sites, in particular these land-based sites um, for treated wastewater discharge. Uh, we also began, we did some preliminary evaluation of, of an ocean outfall. Um, I will not get into detail on the uh, evaluation that we, we did because we have limited time and a number of speakers here. Um, but we did a great deal of data collection and about comparison among these three sites. And um, the, I'll just say the, the Allen parcel is a town-owned parcel, just so you know where we're talking about. Allen parcel is a town-owned parcel that's undeveloped that's north, north of Carriage Shop Road in East Falmouth. Augusta parcel is another town-owned parcel that stretches between uh, Brick Hill Road and 28, uh, immediately north of Great Pond uh, here. Open sand beds 14 and 15 are uh, our northernmost existing discharge beds. That's where um, we, um, that was the most recently set of permitted discharge beds, the uh, existing wastewater plant. And um, the, the concept there is that we would expand the area available there. There is additional area available there and uh, augment the discharge in that area. As I said, we also looked a bit preliminarily at outfalls, but um, that is a, a topic for further evaluation. Um, so the Water Quality Management Committee did discuss these. Um, so uh, I'll stop for a second and talk about the timing. Scott did, um, Scott McGann here with the Health Department did cede some of his time to me. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit more. Yeah, I know I didn't tell Eric that either. Uh, I call, <laughs> sorry, I didn't, and I didn't ask you. Sorry, I hope that's okay. Um, um, let's see, so we presented to the select board um, after uh, the, a vote by the Water Quality Management Committee, and the effluent discharge plan that was voted by the select board earlier this year was to, number one, de designate the existing open sand beds, an expanded version of the existing open sand beds, 14 and 15, as the treated uh, effluent discharge site for the projected flows in the short term. Um, uh, contingent on some additional uh, investigation we need to do. And uh, consider ocean outfall options in Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound, along with further consideration uh, of the Allen and Augusta parcels for projected midterm and long-term flows. So we have a short-term and a long-term discharge plan. Uh, so to summarize the, the Great Pond recommended plan, uh, the preferred approach is we, we do have a component of fertilizer and stormwater management, aquaculture, and a permeable reactive barrier within the Great Pond watershed to uh, assist in meeting the, the load limit. Um, but we also, as we said, will construct a, um, collection, a wastewater collection system in two phases. We will be upgrading the wastewater treatment facility and uh, discharging, as I said, at expanded woods 14 and 15. The contingency approach, uh, the DEP, the state requires that we have a contingency approach when you, when you use uh, alternative strategies like, like these. The state requires that you have a contingency plan in your plan. So we, we, do, we do plan that either 
uh, denitrifying septic systems and or uh, additional future sewering in the upper watershed would be uh, applied if needed. Uh, and then we'd be monitoring in Great Pond as we do in Little Pond and, um, and taking follow-up action if necessary in the future. Uh, so we, uh, you may remember the town voted uh, $24 million to upgrade the wastewater treatment facility last year. Um, the, we will be getting a 0% interest loan from the state for that project, and we're completing the design now. We'll be going to bid um, in the uh, beginning of, of next year. So the next steps are um, we submitted a draft plan to the state uh, earlier this year. We got comments. We're, we're completing our response to that, and we'll be sending a final plan to the state um, in December. Um, in, uh, starting in 2023 and going for, um, through 2025, we'll be constructing those improvements at the wastewater plant. Uh, the couple of years after that, we plan pending uh, two town meeting votes, one next April for design and the following, uh, the, the April after that in 2024 for construction, we would be constructing the phase one sewers on the T-Ticket Peninsula and Mara Vista and the expanded short-term discharge. Meanwhile, we will be evaluating the ocean outfall concept further um, for future discharge. Beyond 2026, we would construct the, the next phase of sewering complete targeted watershed management plans for additional ponds and design and construct next phases of collection system and discharge. Um, so that's it on our current planning process. I did uh, want to talk briefly about something I'm sure we'll be talking more about this evening, which is the state has very recently come out with new regulations uh, that are pr proposed new regulations. Um, and the comment period for the comment period for these new regulations closes on December 16th. Uh, so the town will be submitting comments on them. But it's a it's a set of, of two sets of regulations or two two um, types of regulations. One is a change to the Title V um, regulations, which govern septic systems, uh, and the other is a change at the addition of a new regulation. Um, about watershed permitting. Uh, so the first one would require that uh, more than 15,000 septic systems in Falmouth's 14 impaired watersheds be upgraded to nitrogen removing septic systems within five years. Uh, we can talk more about that, but that's the, that's the uh, short version. Or, or, these two regulations are, it's an either or. Or, within five towns, the town, excuse me, within five years, the town must prepare a watershed management plan uh, and apply for a watershed permit to the state for all of its 14 impaired ponds. Uh, those plans must meet the TMDLs, the total maximum daily loads for nitrogen, uh, for all those ponds uh, within 20 years. And the permits, those watershed permits that we have to apply for, then will make the planned activities and the implementation schedule enforceable requirements. Um, I'll say next, uh, it's the town's feeling that uh, the watershed permit regulations are unrealistic for Falmouth uh, as far as the time frame, the scale, and the cost. Um, and the option to instead upgrade to all IA systems or um, nitrogen removing septic systems is really kind of a red herring. I looked up the definition of that again before this meeting. I'm not sure it's quite the right word, but the I <laughs> quite the right term. But the idea is that it's uh, that concept, um, installing uh, quote nitrogen removing septic systems in all the yards in Falmouth will not meet the nitrogen load requirements of the TMDLs um, because of the complexities of um, of those systems. Uh, and, and maintaining and operating those systems, uh, thousands of individual treatment plants in Falmouth. Uh, so the town is going to be commenting on those regulations, and our plan at the moment is to proceed with our plan as we've been, as we've been moving along all this time. Uh, and that's what I have for now. Thank you. Well, thanks for leaving me 30 seconds. <laughs> And it's always difficult to, you know, when you have the Einstein of wastewater, you have to go yeah. after her. Just use your seconds I, I, I'm just trying to rethink that. I only have four slides because I had to cut them all out. <laughs> <laughs>
is off in order to see up close. Yeah. Chitin. I don't know. But nope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. So your time's up. Yeah. No, this time doesn't count. You're not counting yet. Alright, All right. so I'll be quick. Um, it's a IA, not AI. Um, so let me go quickly through. So what you have in the ground now, everybody hear me okay, I hope is this is your conventional system. This is what everybody's got if you're not on the sewer. That happens to be a cesspool up top. That's Eric's cesspool. It's his beloved cesspool. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a random picture of a cesspool. Anybody between 1978 and 1995 would have a leaching pit, as the picture would show down there. And since 1995, you either got basically a leach pit cut into three up there with your, gallon, with your uh, leaching chambers or maybe a pressure distribution of a shared system that you see here. So the, the th problem is, is that standard septic systems do a fairly good job of taking bacteria out, travel a few feet. Viruses travel a little bit further. The things that are dissolved are just going to travel right through, and that's the nitrogen problem. Is conventional septic systems don't really do anything for nitrogen or phosphorus. We talk a lot about nitrogen. I'm a little frustrated. We should also talk about for phosphorus with fresh water, but we did base this on a nitrogen issue. Um, so now there are systems that reduce nitrogen. We call them IAs, innovative alternative. They were invented in 1995, not invented, but they were conceived around 1995, and it was for a drinking water standard in Title V. The older designs, you've heard this number probably before of 19 milligrams per liter. That number came from an influent coming out of your house at an assumption of 38, because back then we didn't have one thing. We didn't use low flow toilets. So we had you know, a 2.7 gallon flush. So our concentration coming in was 38. And in order to, if you had a well on your property, this is what these were for, to allow you to have more than one bedroom per 10,000 square feet. So the idea behind the older IA technologies was to take enough nitrogen out to meet drinking water standards. However, watersheds need to be at a, a much higher standard, a much more stringent standard. And in the reality is, as your house is coming out, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, between 60 and 70 on your average house, and these IAs average between 25 and 30 milligrams. They're taking out 50, 60 percent of the nitrogen as they were designed for. Half of 38 would be 19. And we need to be well below that. So right now with DEP proposing the regulation, what kind of technologies right now get to that? And Brian's going to talk a lot more because Brian is the test center. Um, but up the top you see a microfast, there's a singular. And they're um, basically recirculating um, inside a special tank. The tanks are a little bit different. And then, so they, they do a little bit to um, basically nitrify. You have to first nitrify before you denitrify. That's the nitrogen cycle. You, have, you take NH4 to NO2, NO3, NO2 to NO3, and then you strip off the oxygen, and it goes away as a gas. Um, and then there's some newer systems down below. You see the wood chip limestone thing there. That's a nitro. That one does, has been performing better. However, there's, I would think, somewhere between 40 to f under 50 of these systems in the state. So that's one of the technologies that we can get down below 10. And that's roughly where you'd need to get with these innovative alternative technologies. So requiring 15,000 new septic systems based on what technology that's going to get there. And DEP does not know that at this time. Right? There's some newer technologies, the best and brightest, the flavor of the month. Don't know whether when you scale up 5,000 of these, will we get to where we want to? So there's still, you know, IA technologies are good. They take out some of the nitrogen, but maybe not enough for a watershed permit. Disagree? Agree? Yeah, that's my, my opinion on it. Um, so here's what the watersheds look like. It's a 2018 photo of this. The 14 watersheds. Okay. So look at your look at your where your house is on the map. You probably got have an 80 percent chance of falling in there. Probably closer to 90 percent chance of falling into one. So as we go into where we're going to sewer and if we're going to go with this, and if the regulation even passes, um, you have to look at there's some limitations to IAs at this point in time. Uh, they are going to cost some more, and they may, may, may or may not be easily um, uh, retrofitted. Um, and then there's going to be some quarterly maintenance, some energy, you know, and, you know, how we're going to design, install, and maintain kind of scares me because we average about 400 septic permits a year. 
and in, you know, if we're going to do uh, 4,000 in a year, it, it, I don't know how we're going to actually pull that off and who's going to maintain it. So there's a lot of, you know, if the regulation comes through, there's going to be a lot of um, figuring out how to practically, you know, utilize IAs to get us down to, you know, an, an acceptable level according to our permit. You know, our permit's going to say, is going to, a permit means something to DEP. They hold a permit and they can revoke a permit. And it's going to be up to us, Amy, really. Uh, it's going to be up to Amy to figure out how to do this. And so, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And we're going to need to figure out, you know, in a combination, IAs are going to be a part of it. It's just right now, the technologies are what they are. Um, you know, it's hard to find operators. It's hard to find, you know, it's, it's, it, people aren't getting into the, the civil engineering trades as much as I like to see, or excavating trades, or who's going to operate and maintain these. Um, and they're all going to be little treatment plants in your backyard. And so that's going to be the alternative to sewering is going to be looking at doing these IAs and hopefully the technology catches up to where we can get to a good, good denitrifying level. Uh, and then, you know, again, of course, there's, um, you know, there's loan programs and so forth for the IAs. Uh, but it's not sort of like a, it's not right now looked at as like a, um, a utility. You know, you look at sewering as a utility as opposed to something you're going to put in your backyard. And what kind of level of support are you going to get you know, financially to, to go ahead and do this. Because I'm going to be the, the, the guy who sends you out that letter and says you haven't upgraded to your D night system according to our watershed permit. And you need to do something. And yes, you might have to rip up your entire septic system or you might be able to retrofit. It's going to depend on each case is going to be unique on how we get to that. You may not have enough pitch or separation between your septic tank in your leach field in order to put that nitro in it. You saw the picture a couple times ago. It's a little long, right? So it's not something you flush down your toilet once a week and it makes the nitrogen go away. It's a little bit more involved. And so there's a lot of different technologies. I think, you know, Brian can talk more about the technologies and how the data is doing. It's just that's sort of the challenge with the, with the D-Night systems. We have about 300 or so, three to 400 in the ground now. And some run better than others. But uh, by and large, I think 20 is probably, 25 is probably a good average of what we're getting you know, somewhere with our current systems. And we know that's not going to be low enough for uh, meeting our TMDLs. So that's what I have to say. Hey. I have no slides. Um, actually, what I really want to talk about is Title V regs, but I was told I had to talk about money. Um, <laughs> That said, um, Title V as it exists now is an abject disaster, and it's made legal the degradation of our water quality in our estuarine ponds. Title V has to change. Title V is really hard to change. DEP's regs aren't perfect, but they're worlds better than what we've got now. Sermon aside. Um, there's never been a better time for Cape Cod to finance wastewater infrastructure than we have now. The next five years are going to be the period of time when there's the most money available to towns across the Cape to mitigate the cost of um, implementing wastewater management programs due to a combination of factors that I'll walk through. And there's no part of Massachusetts where there's more financial uh, subsidy available for municipal infrastructure development than on Cape Cod. The Cape has become transitioned from being in the worst position relative to other municipalities in the 2000, 2010 period to having, being frankly the envy of most municipal entities. The reason is starting in 2009, a series of legislative uh, initiatives passed that have built one on top of the other that have made financing wastewater um, much more affordable. Not inexpensive, but much more affordable than what we confronted prior to that when everybody was sort of locked into paralysis of we can't possibly even think about doing this. The old strategy was look at it, come up with a big number, everybody goes, ah, I can't deal with that. And then they put it aside, or they created a water quality committee and said, you guys go figure out about it, and then come back to us, and then we'll tell you, we don't want to do that. Um, and now, starting in 2009, there's a zero interest program 
that was created initially for a 10-year window that was set to expire in 2019. It doesn't say that it was set aside for the CAPE explicitly, but if you understand the code of the legislative language, which is an interesting and unique dialect that few people ever really learn, um, Cape Cod is treated differently than the rest of the state. So starting in 2009, zero interest program for nutrient reduction projects. There are some other projects statewide that qualify for it. The bulk of that money at zero interest goes to Cape Cod. That program was extended <clears throat> in um, 2018 uh, for another 40 years. So it's in place through 2059, I believe. Um, subsequent to that, legislature created um, this watershed permitting idea, which is now being drafted in regulations. It applies only to Cape Cod. Cape Cod is the only place you can get a watershed permit because of the link in the legislation to the 208 program. Um, also in 2018, as part of a package to uh, expand uh, and change the coverage of the then hotel motel tax to include <clears throat> all forms of overnight stays, um, legislature provided the authority to all towns to increase their local share of that tax, that broader tax, from 4% to 6%, um, and then unique to Barnstable County, established something called the Cape and Islands Water Protection Trust Fund, which is funded out of a 2.75% surcharge on all overnight stays of 30 days or less uh, in Barnstable County, um, and that money is dedicated to a, specific, a special fund that is governed, managed by the state treasurer's office, but governed by a local board made up of each one of the 15 towns, a representative of the board of selectmen or the town manager's office, um, to offset now 25% of the capital cost of state revolving loan fund, zero interest loan for wastewater. So that, uh, that went into effect in 2019. It's allocated money twice in the spring of 22, the spring of 21, $97 million in financial assistance to eight towns. Falmouth, I think, is second or third in, um, on the list of the most money provided from that fund. That is a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in property tax burden. Okay, that money goes, I mean, if you want to live in Barnesville County and go rent a room someplace else in Barnesville County, you're paying for it too, but by and large, most of that revenue comes from people who don't live on Cape Cod, are visiting here, uh, partaking in our economy, and leaving a little something behind that we have to deal with that has increased the cost, and thus the nexus between creating basically a tourist tax to help mitigate wastewater and, and the problem that, that they're exacerbating. Um, so that's an annual source of funding that's governed by a set of regulations that can be counted on to provide 25% of the cost of future state revolving fund loans for wastewater infrastructure. The key to accessing that money is getting into that loan program. You don't get a state SRF loan, you don't get access to the 25% subsidy. Um, the combination of the ARPA, uh, the Build Back well, the, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law and then some of the Inflation Reduction Act have pumped over the next, starting this year, four or five years, um, well in excess of a billion dollars of additional federal money into Massachusetts distributed through the SRF program. So the next five-year window is the period of time when the pie is the largest for the loan pool, and because the loan pool is the source of access to the 25% subsidy, you want to get in the loans, okay? So if you're a Cape Town, tip of average Cape Town, you meet the requirements of a zero interest loan, and let's say you borrow $100 million, you're not paying any interest and you're only paying $75 million back on that 100. There isn't any place else, let alone in Massachusetts, any place else in America, that I'm aware of that you're, you have access to that kind of money these days. Um, and it was one thing when interest rates were two or three percent, it's another thing when they're seven to pay zero. Um, so, um, so there's 
a lot of money out there for municipal projects. And towns aren't stupid. They've responded to the signals that they've gotten and the applications for state revolving fund money from the Cape have skyrocketed in the last two years. Um, so people are in on the game and there is a little bit of a first mover advantage. So there's every reason to put your, to speed up your expenditures on the municipal wastewater side now to take advantage of the money that's available. It's not like it goes away. The revolving loan fund is now a seven something billion dollar revolving loan fund at the state level. So roughly 5% of that $7 billion gets repaid back to the state every year and it goes back out in the next year in terms of new loans. Um, so one other real quick thing on the uh, residential side, um, whether you're doing a um, septic upgrade or a sewer connection, county has adopted changes to their loan program, the Community Septic Management Betterment Program, um, that has lowered the interest rate based on your uh, median income and it's created a sliding scale all the way down to zero. And then just last week, the governor signed legislation that provides $15 million in additional funding to the Cape for two purposes. One, to further build the capital in the Cape and Islands Water Trust Fund uh, to support that 25% principal forgiveness, but also in a new thing that addresses the one remaining unmet financial need for this whole puzzle um, provide the ability to have loan forgiveness of between 25 and 50 percent, depending on where you are in median income, on those Barnesville County loans. So for the first time now, we have the ability to subsidize and reduce the burden of sewer connection or IA upgrades for residential people. So it's all coming together pretty quickly. So that's it. Title V stinks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good evening. Um, so I guess I get I get my eight minutes too. Um, so I've got like two dissertations probably worth of information to give you in eight minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, I also get to follow some slightly depressing information from Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but what I want to do first is uh, I'm going to talk a lot about IA septic system technologies, but the first thing I want to do is to um, propose a little bit of a paradigm shift in our terminology for when we're talking about these systems um, in terms of uh, the term infrastructure. Um, you know, up until more recently, we've typically installed on-site or uh, innovative alternative septic systems in the context of individual houses and individual problems. Uh, might be a groundwater separation issue, might be somebody who lives on a small lot in a zone two, which is a uh, area of wellhead protection and they want to add an extra bedroom. So we might utilize an IA system there. Um, but if we're gonna talk about these systems in a broader context, in a watershed context, where we're potentially uh, utilizing hundreds or thousands of them, um, we really need to start to think about them as infrastructure, the infrastructure that they really and truly are. Um, and I'll propose calling them distributed wastewater treatment infrastructure. So what is distributed wastewater treatment infrastructure? Uh, let's see, can I click ahead? There we go. So here's our hypothetical watershed. This is any of the watersheds or ponds that you have here in Falmouth. What's your problem? Too much nitrogen. We got a bunch of houses around. Um, obviously in areas where you can sewer, it makes a whole lot of sense to sewer, but in those other areas where you could utilize this, um, these IA technologies, um, you would do so uh, to, to sort of backstop where, what you can't do with sewering. So with centralized treatment infrastructure, it's a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear paradigm. You've got houses connected by pipes that move water from one place to another to a centralized treatment plant, um, which treats the wastewater and uh, you have to put it somewhere and that's been a problem that we've seen not only in Falmouth, but really uh, in a lot of different places on the Cape. Um, so it's not, it's not a unique Falmouth problem. Um, the, the sort of corresponding uh, diagram for decentralized or distributed wastewater treatment infrastructure is that rather than moving water from place to place, we're moving data and information from place to place. So you would have individual on-site systems where the wastewater is being disposed or um, distributed into the ground uh, on the on-site level. 
Um, you would be collecting information on those systems, um, ideally remotely, using this great thing we have called the internet, um, and this internet of things of this current age. Uh, that would, all that information would go to some sort of a central location where decisions would be made and identifying the systems that may be troublesome or might need some work, and you would dispatch somebody out to uh, do some work on those systems. Um, and a lot of the systems we're starting to see now do integrate some of those remote sensing technologies into them um, because I think that's a rather important piece of this whole thing and really makes the whole puzzle work together. So the key difference here is rather, again, rather than moving water from place to place, we're moving data and information. And rather than concrete and plastic pipes, uh, the pipes become wires and communication lines from place to place. Different types of decentralized or distributed wastewater infrastructure, on-site systems, so a one-to-one -one sort of a scenario where you have one house, one system. Uh, we also have cluster types of technologies where you have maybe four to five or 10 or 20 houses going into a single location for treatment uh, with disposal in a nearby area. So that's kind of the concept of uh, on-site systems as infrastructure, and that'll be important in a couple minutes, but what I want to jump to now is what are, what are some of the technologies that are available? So these are our currently best performing technologies, and Scott did talk about a couple of these. Um, so what we're seeing is, I've, I've grouped them into a couple simple categories here. Uh, the less than 10 milligram per liter total nitrogen, which seems to be the threshold that we're targeting right now. Um, there are some that fall between 10 and 15, and then there are others that are kind of in the mix or don't have a whole lot of third-party data available. Um, so to start with, at the top of the list, the Nitro system by Clean2 is the one that's getting all the press attention right now. Uh, that particular system, as I understand it, has installed uh, over 60 of those uh, installations have gone in the ground. And that's an important number to have in terms of the approval process for the state of Massachusetts to move from a provisional approval into a general approval, which would allow much broader use. Uh, a technology needs to install at least 50 systems and monitor them for three years. So Nitro has crossed that particular threshold is now uh, up to, I think, above 60 at this point. Um, at the test center, we work sort of closely with this technology, in part because it was uh, more or less developed by the vendor at our facility. Uh, it was an example of somebody who had an idea on a napkin and they wanted to try it out and they needed a place to do it. So they came to the test center with their prototype, installed it, did some testing on it, tweaked it, improved it, and then decided to roll it out to the world. They started installations out on Martha's Vineyard and they've since been expanding. I'm sure you've seen in the newspaper uh, some information uh, about the Schubel Pond project that the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition has been spearheading for the last couple of years. Uh, in that project, the Clean Water Coalition uh, convinced 15 homeowners in a small neighborhood near Schubel Pond to install uh, nitrogen reducing septic system technologies. Um, because they're a nonprofit, they could select the technology that was going to be installed, and they selected the nitro technology for that project. Um, so they insta they've installed 12 of the 15 uh, systems at this point, and um, there are a few other project partners in that. Uh, US EPA, I'm sure you've heard of them, and maybe USGS uh, is somebody else that you've heard about. Um, they're doing a lot of groundwater monitoring in the area because we wanted to assess not only how the systems are performing and the actual out of the pipe number that we're getting with them, we wanted to see what's actually going on in the groundwater. So. USGS put in a whole bunch of groundwater monitoring wells, and US EPA has been doing the monitoring on those wells, uh, both before and now after installation of those systems. Uh, we at MassTC are uh, contracted by EPA to do the operation and maintenance and monitoring on these systems. Um, so I have great familiarity with the numbers we're seeing. I can't give you exact numbers tonight uh, because that data is owned by EPA and we can't release it yet, but what I can say is on average for the systems that have been installed, uh, we're getting 85 milligrams per liter total nitrogen coming from the septic tank. Um, and the systems themselves are uh, significantly below five milligrams per liter for effluent, uh, which is a pretty, pretty major accomplishment uh, in the world of on-site systems. That last five milligrams per liter is a very difficult uh, chunk of nitrogen to get rid of. And, I'm sure Amy would attest to that, even at the treatment plant level, is a very difficult piece of nitrogen to deal with. Uh, the Nitrex technology is one that's been around for probably two decades at this point. Uh, that's a technology by Lombardo Associates. Um, 
It was patented, I think, back in the mid-2000s. Uh, again, a technology that gets extremely good nitrogen removal. Um, I don't have a whole lot of third-party data for that. We don't work as closely with the Nitrex system, and there aren't as many installations for us to assess that technology. Um, but it seems its, uh, its performance is on par with the Nitro technology as well. Uh, the layer cake technology or non-proprietary wood chip systems, uh, for those who uh, live in Falmouth and know George Hoyfelder, who is my predecessor at the test center, but he's also one of your Board of Health members. Um, he's been working on the layer cake technology for a number of years now uh, as a non-proprietary solution for on-site wastewater treatment. Um, a few of the designs that George and others have come up with over the years have shown removals uh, in that less than 10 category. Not quite as good as the Nitro and Nitrex technologies, but also very good. Is that my one minute, or is that the, is that my? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's it. That's it, <laughs> all right. Anyway, so Fuji Clean HydroAction, Biomicrobics, there are a couple other technologies. <laughs> and then I've got a couple others at the bottom there, JDL, MMBR. One other thing that I want to cover real quickly, and this is an important piece of the whole puzzle, is how do we manage the life cycle of these systems? Uh, you would do so with something called a responsible management entity, which is an organization that's tasked with overseeing the cradle-to-grave life cycle of on-site or decentralized systems. Barnstable County recently received a grant from US EPA for a five-year project to develop and implement a regional RME program to assist towns uh, that wish to move forward with utilizing IA on-site systems uh, as part of a watershed management plan. That includes the town of Falmouth. Uh, primary goals, help the towns meet their TMDLs, reduce risk to homeowners, be cost effective, be financially self-sustainable, maintain flexibility because every town is different. And I guess that's all that I have. Again, totally uh, hand-boned a whole, dis whole dissertation worth of information, but if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at the test center. Thank you, all of the panelists. Those were uh, great presentations. I'd like to take this opportunity for you to have discussion among yourselves. Uh, if there is a point one of you made that you would like to address or uh, dialogue about, um, you, I'm, this is the moment for that. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying um, I appreciated the introduction to uh, all the funding that's available. And Falmouth has. Um, taken advantage of as much of this funding as we've been able to so far, and we are definitely planning to continue with that. So the town has uh, gotten 25, we've gotten forgiveness on some of the existing debt that we had uh, incurred for the Little Pond project. We have um, a low interest loan, line or a zero percent interest loan lined up for our next project. We have used um, the ARPA funds um, for the design of our project, and we have applied for additional ARPA grant beyond that. So we, uh, we appreciate the um, advocacy, and, um, and we are poised to take advantage of that. I would add to that, and that Andrew is too modest, and that most of these financing uh, miracles that have occurred in the last half a dozen years for Cape Cod have occurred because Andrew thought them up, pushed them, and got the legislature to, to, to make them happen. <clears throat> I, I wish I could be as enthusiastic for his enthusiasm about the uh, proposed regulation changes that DEP has put out, but uh, I can't. Well, thank you. Um, and I'll respond to the compliment by, by picking a fight. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, the, the thing about the DEP regs is that they actually don't want the five-year IA requirement to go into effect. It's really a way to change the dynamic between the voter and the town officials, which historically has been town comes up with a big wastewater infrastructure bill People in town go, yeah, we don't want to pay that. Go pound sand. Um, and nothing happens. The idea here is by imposing a burden on the individual homeowner to incur an expense in their backyard that can be waived. 
by the town stepping forward and saying we will be the responsible entity and put ourselves on a voluntary permit that binds us to implementing nitrogen limitations on a schedule to which we are not currently being held, the town can absolve the individual homeowner of their individual burden. And so, frankly, it's politics at the local level that it's trying to change to encourage people from being the individual voter from being the impediment the town's moving forward to creating a dynamic where the individual goes to the town and says, you have a responsibility to me as an individual to shield me from this responsibility of incurring the obligation to do an IA system. So yeah, I don't think anybody in their right mind, A, thinks that you can convert 120 something odd thousand uh, septic systems across Barnstable County in a five year period, nor does anybody who really knows anything think that that actually solves your problem. So, sure. Is that a, you know, do we want that? No. But you tell me, I'm waiting to hear the better idea to get towns to move forward. Town is moving. Eric and I have jousted over the years over how quickly you get east uh, to Akoit Bay uh, to no great resolution. Um, but Falmouth is ahead of the curve if you look at, if you build a curve on all 15 towns. So, you know, looking at this across the region, somebody somehow has to create an incentive to get towns beyond just making more money available to get us on a reasonable schedule. And 75% of the way in 20 years, um, you know, most of us aren't here anymore. Um, is that aggressive enough? I don't really feel that great about it, but I get it. So I actually give the administration a lot of credit. I was at DEP for 20 odd years, and I was at DEP the last time we did Title V regulation revisions, the code that Scott mentioned that went into effect in 95. Um, it's been 28 years since the code has been upgraded. And the code, as I said earlier, has created the situation that we're trying to restore and recover from now. And everybody's known that the code was inadequate from the day it was put in place. Um, the difficulty and trauma to go from a system that had cesspools legal to what we have now drove some really good environmental professionals out of the field. And everybody who has a history and a memory in that agency and five successive governors all remember how politically horrible it was to change Title V. So is this perfect? Hell it isn't. But I give the Baker administration a good deal of credit being willing to at least put something that's an improvement, imperfect as it is, on the table. And I haven't heard any good idea that's a viable alternative that moves the needle. And what I'm afraid of is if we all say, oh, this is bad, it's going to make us uncomfortable, incoming administration is going to go, yeah, I hear from a bunch of people on the Cape, they don't want us messing in the yards. Most people start, don't start an administration by requiring people to do things to their home. I don't know when the dynamics line up and the people line up and the politics and people leaving office and all of a sudden having the willingness to put something like this difficult on the table, when that's gonna come again. So I think we pass on it at our own peril. I think uh, Eric has a point to make. Yeah. This is a great opportunity actually because we've got an audience and we've got a real advocate and we have people who are, have dug into this, these proposals and have real concerns. So this is a great time and we thank you for coming. A lot of people in this room don't know how much Falmouth has done around wastewater in the last dozen years. And let me tell you what Falmouth's done. 15 million bucks to upgrade the treatment plant. We now treat our wastewater to three parts per milliliter. That's the best anybody in the state of Massachusetts gets, okay? That's what we do here at Falmouth. We put $50 million into the Little Pond Sewer Service Area and the Bourne Pond Inlet opening. We voted for that in 2014. The voters said yes. Last year, we went to town meeting and said, we need $25 million to upgrade the sewer treatment plant. 
It went through town meeting without discussion, and it went through the voters two to one. We now have 60 million bucks set aside for the year 2024 to do the next phase of sewering, and the voters and the town meeting will do it. And the reason they will do it is because we are doing it in our time frame. Old debt gets paid off, we can take on new debt. So we can go to the taxpayers, as we did each one of those times, and say, we're doing this without raising your taxes. That is a really good selling point when you're going to the voters and asking for millions and millions of dollars. We would like to keep to that way of doing business because it works here. If we have to go to the state in, in 18 months and say, we're going to do 14 watershed permits, which will reduce all this nitrogen in all 14 estuaries in 20 years, the price tag for that will be well beyond our capacity to go to the voters and say, we can pay for this without raising your taxes. The next, if we're obliged, which if you sign up for these watershed permits, you are not, it's not voluntary anymore. You are mandated to do these things on DEP schedule. And if you do them on DEP schedule, the amount of cost that the voters will be looking at will be well above anything that we can say to them will be done without raising your taxes. We will then be saying, we will be raising your taxes a lot because the state made us do it. And I don't want to be making that case to Falmouth voters. I think we've, Falmouth ha, has done an emor, enormously terrific job. We can keep right on doing it. We have windows of opportunity that drop. But once it becomes a state mandate uh, to do 14 estuaries in five years with a plan that's going to get them all done in 20, it'll break the bank. Okay, I'd like to take some questions from the floor. I'll bring the microphone over to you. Just a, a quick question about um, if under the proposal that would get us to say 75% of the desired target in 20 years, and if that um, approach breaks the bank, I'd like to understand better um, if we continue on the path we are, which is not raising taxes, how many years out would it take to get to 75% of the target? 40 years? 60? I, I, I don't have a sense of that. Does anybody have any insight into, into that? Each watershed would have its own plan, and right now we have no idea what that plan is. So you, you certainly can't put a timetable to it as far as what you'd be doing when, and you certainly can't put a price tag to it. Uh, question for Brian, uh, Doug Brown, thanks. So I see your enthusiasm for the uh, on-site idea. I wonder if you can tell me how successful you think it might be with seasonal homes, you know, with the uh, denitrifying tank system. I, I'm hopeful that the layer cake will work because I think of that of, uh, as more of a filter rather than a, a biotic system. Can you share your thoughts on that? Sure, sure. Um, well, first I would say that the layer cake system is a biological system. It's entirely based on biology. Um, the, as far as the seasonal issue goes, um, the first thing I would say is that seasonality-wise, you've already removed 75% of the nitrogen because there's nobody there. Uh, for 75 percent of the year. The other thing I would say is that the research that we've done and uh, looking at a lot of the data sh shows that there is, yes, there is a lag period when systems need to start up. Um, and it varies from technology to technology. The older technologies are probably the poorest performers when it comes to this startup period. Um, but you're probably looking somewhere in the range of two to three weeks for a full startup period. And we're still really trying to get our hands around that with the nitro technology at this point. Um, and then this Shubal Pond project should help to answer a lot of those questions because there are some seasonal homes there. Um, and we monitor those systems monthly. So we'll have a lot of good data to say whether or not that particular technology will do well or not in a seasonal situation. I have a question about separating out the Falmouth portion of Walkway Bay. The actual Walkway Bay needs dwarf that of Great Pond. I'm not saying that Great Pond isn't also needing, but if Maspi does the same and, and uh, artificially decreases the priority because the Maspi portion is lower than its other bays, um, doesn't that just mean nobody will clean it? Aren't we, aren't we artificially reducing the priority Walkway Bay, which is actually a very important estuary to this area. Who wants to answer that? 
Uh, we can both talk, either one of us can talk about it. Wakoit Bay is a very important water body. You're absolutely right. It's been researched more than any other water body, in, <laughs> at least in Massachusetts. I don't know uh, beyond that. Uh, and it has, uh, it's the largest uh, water body of all these coastal ponds. Um, it is a big challenge, um, among other reasons be, being that it is the furthest from our existing system. Uh, and uh, so existing collection system. Uh, so we have been proceeding west to east, and that is the plan, though, as you saw in that, um, in the midterm um, slide that we showed, we do, we do not expect to um, sewer as much of the, of the peninsulas, of the Davisville Peninsula, for example, and of the peninsula beyond that, that we expect to, basically, the, the next project beyond the uh, Great Pond project would be a project that would focus on um, some very densely developed areas out in east of our current service area. Um, so I, I, uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Wakoit Bay is an enormous resource, um, but we have um, enormous challenges, and we're taking them as we can handle them. Let me just elaborate on that. We have 14 estuaries surrounded by people who love them, and they all think their estuaries should be first. And we understand why Wakoit would think that, too. We, we've had some very productive conversations with Mastery when, when Andrew was selecting there. Uh, we've actually agreed on the allocation, who, which town has to deal with how much nitrogen, because uh, you know, we both contribute to it. And, and we, we have that kind of agreement, at least conceptually, in, in place. And Mastery is now actually stepping up to the plate and, and doing some sewering of, of their own. So, so there is some progress. But I, I wouldn't argue a bit with you that it won't come soon enough for Wakoit Bay, but it won't come soon enough for 12 or 13 other estuaries, too. We the plan. We don't even have a plan. We did agree with Mashpee to, to, to do a plan, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, we just didn't agree on time frame. Jeff, is that right? That there's just no time frame for the plan between Mashpee and Well, we, we, we were working with the <laughs> we were working with the committee that resigned, so um, <laughs> it, was, it sort of kind of fell off the table for a while. <laughs> um, we, We'd be happy to work with the committee again once it gets its uh, members together. It just seems that that waiting until 2026 is a long time to start the process of building the plans for these other watersheds. I'll jump in a little bit, just take some of the heat. Um, as a as as a recovering public official um, <laughs> and a recidivist, um, you know, it's really hard for towns to get their head around taking these things on. You know, and, you know when I was in Mashpee, I, I looked at, you know, Falmouth and Barnstable with a degree of envy because Mashpee doesn't have an Amy. Mashpee doesn't have a Dan Santos. And so you left with people like me and Brian to a degree to push this agenda as like your second job at night, um, working with a bunch of people who, some of whom sort of care about it, some of whom tell you they kind of care about it and don't necessarily really understand it. Um, and so, you know, I'm on both sides of the equation. It's all taking too long. It's all taking too long. That said, it's really hard to move. Um, and, you know, 
I come down at the end of the day that, you know, simple, voluntary, we set the agenda as individual communities on when and how and frankly if we're going to solve these problems um, just isn't a good enough answer anymore. Um, you know, and it was interesting you used the word mandate with the permit. Um, the other part of this whole thing that's kind of interesting is <clears throat> everybody's been talking about the obscure provisions of Prop 2.5 that resulted in you getting a tax refund this year. The other obscure part of 2.5 is the mandates requirement. And the mandates requirement says that if the state imposes a new requirement on a municipality post-1986, it got to pay for it. So the watershed permits actually aren't a mandate. They're a voluntary action, and they're trying to incentivize you as a municipality to voluntarily put your head in the noose. Right. Right. To be blunt about it. Right. And then have an enforceable schedule that holds you to what you said you were going to do. That sounds pretty negative. The positive side of it is that if you've got a permit and the permit acknowledges that you're going to be implementing measures over a 20-year period, a set of measures that are the mix of which is your own community's determination. The state's not coming in a watershed permit saying, thou shalt sewer everything. They're going to say, what's your plan? You want to do IAs over here? You want to do shellfish over here? You want to do inlet widening over there? You want to sewer this little bit? That's your plan. Fine. What's the schedule to implement that? You can do that. Um, but while you're doing that, most of your water bodies remain out of compliance because you're phasing these programs in. The upside of having a permit is that it shields you from third-party litigation that can put you in a position of being subject to penalties in court order for being in non-compliance. So as long as you have a permit, you're allowed to not meet standards as long as you're in compliance with the cycle of the permit. There's an enormous value to towns to not be subject to third-party litigation in these areas because there have been a couple of shots at the king on this one. They haven't quite hit the mark yet, but one of them is going to stick. Um, and the worst thing to have is a state or federal judge mandating your plan what the mix is, what the time frame is, and how you pay for it. Because they don't have to care about maintaining levels, debt service, table, or any of the rest of that stuff. So there's a yin and a yang here to watershed permits. They are intended, the, the political strategy here is to get away from mandate. Because the one thing that's abundantly clear, there's no way in hell anybody's going to um, take a regulatory action that transfers the cost from the municipality to the Commonwealth. That I think we can all agree on. I jump in with a question. If we were to go with the watershed permit um, avenue, what sort of staffing levels would you need in order to write those permits? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> um, Certainly, the way we have written our past um, plans is with the assistance of outside consultants. Um, but you do need staffing in the town to have to represent the town's interest and in you know have the, the the be the driving force. Um, I can tell you that one person cannot manage the existing system and plan for all the future ones and execute the you know, the contracts. So I think towns will need additional staff, at least at the higher level, to um, move forward with that. Don't hire the wrong person. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the possibilities of the discharge into Vineyard Sound, which is probably more realistic than Buzzard Bay because the currents are, would dissipate things faster. We turned that down must be 40 years ago, but um, I know there's right now it wouldn't even, I think there's state laws that wouldn't even permit it to, um, because the area, the waters are protected, but, but that would be, a, 
if you're looking for a carrot and stick, if if to, if we have going to be forced to do everything faster, at least they could help us find ways to discharge the water. Yeah. Um, and then my other, I had a second question, which is, I know we've had a bad example with the auto camp, but what what is the potential for having? Uh, I think C, doesn't Seacrest have a treatment plant yeah. to have some of the, our larger developments um, treat treat nitrogen on site? I live in one that's a potential for that, and um, how will that? I think that I'd like to hear Brian talk more about it. How? difficult or easy it would be to, to monitor these. Or you would put a sensor, I suppose, that would sense the amount of nitrogen in the water coming out of a distance from the, uh, the bleaching field. And, and um, I, I just feel if we get, I think inevitably we're going to have to have some um, alternative systems in parts of town. And so figuring out the, the the mix it would be of the private responsibility with the town responsibility for management. I know we had that whole issue with the grinder pumps, which I'm not supposed to even talk about, but thank you. So do you want to talk, do you want a response to that quick? So on the, uh, on the outfall question, outfalls are no longer prohibited. There was a change made to the Ocean Sanctuaries Act, which allows them. None have been permitted yet since that change. Um, uh, we are, as, as I mentioned, working and as we are working um, on the beginnings of an outfall evaluation and we will be coming back to the town um, in the near future to talk more about that. Our first step is really to get a better idea of what the cost might realistically be uh, so that we know at least that side of it, how feasible it, it might be. Um, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties and difficulties in uh, pursuing an outfall, but at this point, because of the challenges of land-based discharge, we are definitely taking that seriously. Uh, but I don't have detailed information for you on that right now. Did sure, sure. No, uh, you know, I had to really run through my RME slides really, really rather quickly, but the, the responsible management entity program, like I said, <coughs> is it's the equivalent of a, of a sewer utility for on-site systems. The concept there is to take away as much responsibility from individual homeowners and try to manage systems and finance them in the same way that you would fund and manage sewer systems. Um, and that's the critical piece of this. Um, so that program would look to do things like uh, take away the operation and maintenance responsibility from individual homeowners so that they're not necessarily the ones directly on the hook for having to hire an individual contractor to do that work for them. Um, the RME program that we're setting up would uh, do all the monitoring that's associated with that. Um, it would also uh, help to address the long-term long uh, replacement of system components or uh, system pumping. That's another uh, important piece of the on-site puzzle. Um, and the cost for that um, would be much like your sewer utility. You get a bill at the end of the year, just like you would for a sewer, and you will get for a sewer. Um, that should be, in my estimation, an approximately uh, an equal cost to what you would expect for a sewer utility. That's, that's the goal with that program. And it's not just the long-term operation and maintenance of the systems. We're, we're taking a, a much more holistic view of that program, which is to say, uh, rather than having individual homeowners having to figure out how to do all the financing on their own and find a designer on their own and find an installer on their own, which is frankly, if you're doing thousands of systems, an impossible ask and quite unreasonable considering you're protecting uh, a water body that they may never really get a whole lot of time to go and actually visit in their busy schedules. Um, I think it's only fair that we set up some sort of utility that uh, rolls out those systems in a way that you would roll out sewer infrastructure. Um, so those are the goals of the program. We're working very diligently and hard to to get there, but it is a new paradigm. You know, it's not like uh, we're pulling from pages of a book that's already been written. We're we're writing the book as we go. Um, so I can't. I don't want to overpromise what we can deliver on this program, uh, but we're certainly rest assured working as hard as we can toward that goal, and that is the ultimate goal: a more equitable system um, for on-site technologies. Um, I have two questions about nitrogen loading. And I was wondering, how well are we informed about the likely build-out in our watershed areas? Uh, I mean, with mortgages are high right now, it's not going to happen right now, but 
where, where is the building going to take place? And I know Falmouth is good about buying property that we think is uh, crucial in the wetlands. But how does that look, and do we have a good handle on it? The other part is I'm wondering about seasonal uh, residency. Do we have a handle on how much of seasonal residency, which a lot of them are very much adjacent to the ponds, is changing over to year-round residency? And how does that look over the next few years? Just wondering about nitrogen loading. Well, you're, you're absolutely right in a couple of respects. In the, most of our estuaries, we're fairly built up. And, and Falmouth is not building a lot of new homes anymore. We're, there might be 50 new building permits a year, and 25 of them are teardowns. It's, it's really way down from what it used to be, which is like three or 400 new homes in a year back 20, 30 years ago. So the, the new building is not that much. But what you're, what you're seeing is old buildings, little two-bedroom cottages in Mary Vista are now becoming four-bedroom houses. Uh, so the old stuff is getting bigger, and we are encouraging development in the Route 28 T-ticket uh, uh, t area, commercial area, where we would like paved parking lots and 60-year-old shell buildings to come down, and we'd like to see some rental apartments go up so people can live somewhere. So we, but all of that will add to the nitrogen issue. You're absolutely right. The other, the other part of that, I didn't mean to cut you off, Scott, Sorry. is the utilization of properties as short-term rentals um, really impacts, I think, the intensity of use in a short period of time. So, you know, if you lived in a house three months a year, you probably wouldn't want 12 people in it. If you're using that house for a weekend or a week, yeah, it's not so bad. Right, so you know you're getting, and it's really hard to get a handle on those dynamics. You know, post-pandemic, water use writ large across the Cape is up about 10 percent. Um, solid waste, both towns, 10, 12, 15 percent. That what I've heard. So there's clearly been some intensification of use of existing dwellings. How long and durable are those patterns? I don't know, um, but you know the short-term rental thing is a big deal, and it's having an impact on affordability of housing, availability of rental, nitrogen loading, neighborhood impacts, and on the good side, you know, we're all making a lot of money on wastewater uh, from increases in um, in in use of short-term rental property. So we're kind of, we're hooked on it to a degree. Yeah, and with the sewer, when we did Mara Vista, you were limited to four bedrooms. And you'd probably do the same thing with on-site. You would just have to add up the number of bedrooms in the watershed and limit it on that. So somebody could tear down a three-bedroom and make it bigger, but it would still be a three-bedroom. So you're probably going to use bedrooms and come up with that sort of thing like we did with sewer. You do that with Title V. So you'd say nobody in that watershed can have more than either what currently exists on the property or some number no more than three. I don't know, whatever the number that happens to be. You'd be doing it through bed, I mean, through bedrooms because that's what Title V uses for flow. But there's also a lot of games people can yeah, play. No doubt. You know, Trust I me, I, I look at every building permit that comes down. Right. So I don't I'm have closets in, my, in that room. It's not a bedroom. I don't have, you know, I just door did widths a, I just, are a certain width. They're not a bedroom. I just did a, a three-story, 4,000-square-foot, two-bedroom building permit. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes. It's the magic of cased openings. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we, again, that's what I do every day. So we'd be limiting that through the building permit review. We have to look at every building permit, and we have to look at it on its value and assess each one. And that's what we would do as we go forward. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, I think Andy and Brian can uh, respond to this best. Uh, what if we were to set up a, your idea for distributed management utility do you think the state would be flexible in the time frame instead of five years give give more time to to cover all those uh, homes in the area and do you think uh, they would be more generous with financing to uh, that kind of an entity that would help people finance and uh, 
and install these systems, monitor I think, them. I think if you did, if you said, assume Brian's pilot sort of creates the structure for an RME, so let's assume that exists for a minute. Um, if the town were to come in and say, my watershed program relies on the RME that Barnesville County has developed and that structure, and we're going to apply IA systems in this area of town, you'd have that 20-year window in your permit to implement it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it is, as a non-point source distributed thing, it's already SRF eligible. So the ability of an RME, town of Falmouth RME, says we want to apply for $80 million to see the installation of, you know, 1,500 or whatever number of septic systems. You could get an SRF loan for that today under the current rules as there exist, and that would unlock the 25% principal forgiveness associated with that. So all those things can work. That's why I think, like, the watershed permit is pretty flexible the way it's designed. Great. The, thank you. The Water Quality Committee is very excited about what Brian is doing because uh, John Waterbury and others have been working up scenarios for the, for the watersheds on the Buzz's Bay side. You remember those were the ones with fairly small nitrogen problems compared to the South Coast. And, and we think if the, if the IAs that perform well continue to perform well, and if the state will get its act together and give them a general use uh, uh, applicability, that, that we can deal with the nitrogen problems in at least four of those estuaries just with IAs, or perhaps IAs and the PRB, but, but the point being not sewering. But we're already on that kind of timetable. We, we could do that in the next few years, uh, and probably would. Uh, if we've got to go out and do 14 plans for 14 estuaries, we're going to be sitting there doing plans for the next few years, and, and, uh, and it, it's quite likely to slow down the implementation of actually putting one, one or three or four of these in, into estuaries. Brian, did you want to respond? Oh, no. Just agree. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry to close this down. I know it, we could probably go on for another hour with questions and answers. But uh, I want to take this moment to thank everyone for attending and our panelists in, in particular for giving us of their time and expertise on this topic, which is clearly of very large interest. So thank you very much. Thank you.